That's enough. Put that hammer down. Uh, yeah, no. Bad call. He loves his hammer. You want me to put the hammer down? It was during the first Avengers movie, In a Forest, that we saw the Marvel Holy Trinity. Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America. The three men brought to the Avengers unique strengths. Tony, his technological genius, Thor brought godly strength, and Steve grounded the group with his resolute morality. And upon this bedrock, Marvel built the greatest franchise we have ever seen. A decade later with Tony's snap, we got what we wanted, an incredible end to an incredible story of standing up to subjugation in all forms and how sometimes the price is the ultimate sacrifice. And so ended Marvel Phase 3, with three of our six characters getting satisfactory, if not heartbreaking ends to their stories. And began the age of Phase 4, aptly described by the creators as being about guilt and consequences. In a lot of ways, Phase 4 is a correction of the previous three phases, where the male heroes led the way in the MCU, with a few women making their mark and the representation to many was not sufficient. And with many heavy hitters permanently retired out of the series, it was time to bring the newest talent to the forefront. So this should have been an exciting time for Marvel and their fans. Unfortunately, it's been what could be best described as a multi-billion dollar repeated series of belly flops. Aside from Spider-Man Far From Home, none of the movies and TV shows have resulted in solid box office or streaming numbers for Marvel. Even the highly anticipated Thor Love and Thunder has had one of the worst Rotten Tomato ratings for the MCU, and one of the largest box office falls in the second weekend of its release. So what's going on? Well, if the creators of these shows and movies are to be believed, it's because we're all racist or sexist or bigoted. That we don't like the fact that women or women of color or men of color or people from the LGBTQ community taking on the mantle of heroes. Now, I'm not saying this argument is completely false. If we're looking at the entire world here, which is the market for these movies, we will always find people who don't like something due to their prejudice. But this is most definitely not the only answer to this question. It is, however, a convenient answer. There's no doubt about that, since it's an answer that is nearly impossible to rebut, because it stops the conversation in its tracks and prevents any further discussion of what lessons the creators and writers of these shows can learn from their failure. So, in this video, we're going to do a deep dive into Marvel Phase 4 by going through the problems, the true Marvel agenda, and its impact. My first problem with Phase 4 is the bait and switch. At the beginning, there was plenty of excitement for Phase 4 with the promise of an exciting Loki show that would explore various versions of him, tantalizingly teased in the trailer. But once the show aired, it was nothing but a trick befitting Loki the god of mischief, since Loki really wasn't the star of Loki. What is this about? This isn't about you. I mean, he's there and has plenty of screen time, but he really isn't feeling like himself, since this is a time for guilt and consequences. No, the Loki show is about Sylvie, the female Loki, who is far superior to our beloved devious delinquent, and Loki is here, thankfully, to provide Sylvie with emotional support. You did it on your own. You had rings around them. You're amazing. As she makes tenuous decisions that risk the stability of the sacred timeline. If that sentence didn't make sense to you, don't worry. You're one of the lucky ones. You avoided the major snooze fest that was Loki. By the way, at your desk, that magazine. Yeah, the one on jet skis? Yes. Why'd you have that? Because they're awesome. <laughs> but they are. Yeah. You know, some things, actually most things... But the bait and switch didn't end there, since Doctor Strange 2 isn't really about Doctor Strange. He's really here to empower our new hero, America Chavez, and remind her how wonderful she already is. I've come here to tell you to trust yourself. Trust your power. 
That's how we stop her. A few moments later. Also, he spends a lot of time being talked down to and emotionally kicked in the balls for dropping the ball when it came to Christine Palmer, which he did repeatedly in literally every universe. And we see it again with Hawkeye, which is not a show about Hawkeye. Why would you think it would be, you cute little dum-dum? It's of course about Kate Bishop, but don't worry, Hawkeye is her faithful little sidekick as she navigates bad guys and gals and pushes the plot forward and repeatedly tells Hawkeye that he needs better branding. Look, I have no problem with female heroes being added to the roster, but taking characters that are established, some established over a full decade worth of films, and then convincing fans that you can get more of them, follow along on their journey further, only to find out that they are being searched and replaced by female characters. Well, frankly, that's very dishonest and very disrespectful to a loyal fan base. And what about Thor? Because they have done a bit of a search and replace with him as well. I Adding the almighty Thor in there, who makes sure to lecture Gore the God Butcher on the perils of sexism because he calls her Lady Thor instead of calling her the almighty Thor or Dr. Jane Foster. Bitch, why would he know your name? And if that sentence didn't make sense to you, don't worry, you're one of the lucky ones because you avoided the insincere heap of hot garbage put together by a man who, who honestly doesn't care about anything. That's it. That's, that's my range. My range is me. I don't try and I'm successful. That's how we get the movie. I'm going to come back to Thor Love and Thunder later because what they did to Thor's character was one of the worst treatments of heroes I've ever seen. Instead, let's talk about problem number two. This is too easy. The biggest lure of heroic films is that we get to witness heroes taking on problems best embodied in villains. Through intense amount of strife, these heroes find the courage and fortitude to overcome them. And this is true for superheroes as well since they lay out the drama of good triumphing over evil on an epic scale. But just as much as we need good heroes, we need good villains and a good story that tests our heroes to their limits. Unfortunately, Marvel Phase 4 doesn't agree Agree with this form of storytelling, since all the new heroes come out of the box ready-made. There isn't much growth that they need to experience in order to meet their full potential aside from maybe a slight lack of belief in themselves. Kate Bishop, despite being a young girl, is immediately able to take on the Mafia. She's easily able to face off against a Black Widow. Those karate classes were really worth every dime, I guess. Black Widow takes all sorts of punches, hits, crashes falls and walks them off like she's a super soldier. And taking down Drakov and his red room was simply a matter of headbutting a desk and a couple minutes of work by Melina. Cersei is easily able to stop a celestial, which is a god, from being born and ripping apart the earth by turning him to marble, even though her powers thus far have been totally unrelated. I mean, she was creating water, right? And like a tree, I think? And if all that didn't make sense to you, then I'm with you. Even I don't fully understand the Eternals. Looks cool, though. I could go on, but you get the point. This is all too easy. And when they show us female heroes have incredibly heroic moments, they feel a little dissatisfactory. For one one single reason. We all hate women. No, because this all feels unearned. Because we haven't seen the traditional journey of a hero get tested, get knocked down, and forced to reconcile with their own deficiencies and come back stronger than ever. Let's look at Iron Man as an example. When we meet Tony for the first time in the MCU, it's obvious he's highly competent and the greatest inventor of his age, but has a clear flaw, his willful blindness. Blindness to the impact of his creations on the rest of the world, blindness to his business partner's true nature, and most importantly of all, blindness to his own insufficiencies. And we see him go through hell, get beaten down, and build himself back up to rise to become an incredible hero. Alternatively, what if Tony was perfect from the beginning, and the only thing he was missing was a slight amount of confidence in himself, which is easily remedied by Pepper? Well, that would have made for a pretty rotten viewing experience. But let's do one better and use a good example of a female hero. In my last video about woke feminism, 
time, I briefly talked about Rita Vertasky from Edge of Tomorrow, who is easily one of my favorite heroes. During the introduction, there are several references to Rita, or as she is known, the Angel of Verdun, after she helped win a decisive battle over the invading aliens. While Tom Cruise's character, Cage, is shown as incompetent and out of his depths, and frankly, a complete coward, Rita is the symbol of the ultimate warrior. The movie builds up Cage's fear and panic perfectly, and despite his being completely ill-prepared for battle, he is dropped into a war zone. In this chaotic nightmare, it's exciting to watch Rita's entrance, equipped with her chosen weapon, a helicopter blade. And Cage, along with the audience, looks up at her in awe. This scene is perfectly executed. After establishing her as incredibly powerful, competent, and brave, the Angel of Verdun is no match for this alien invasion. The enemy is far more dangerous than we thought. If you've seen the movie, then you know that this is not the end for Rita, since Cage accidentally co-ops a power from the aliens, which resets the day every time he dies. So what makes Rita a compelling hero is that despite all of her ability, she is not invulnerable, and she's not enough. And seeing the reality of the enemy's strength, she trains Cage to work side by side with her to accomplish their goal. This is how you create a compelling heroic tale. And this is exactly why Layla saving Moon Knight is not exciting. Just like Sylvie doing anything is boring. Just like Yelena constantly talking about how dangerous she is, is boring. <sighs> You kill me again. Oh, Kate Bishop, you are so funny. That's hilarious. That one is the funniest. <laughs> and all this feels unearned because until we get to know a person's weaknesses, their struggles, and see them work towards excellence, we really don't care if they win. This, all of this, is unearned. Earned. And this leads me to the third issue with Marvel Phase 4, Black and White Thinking. My biggest issue with the stories in Phase 4 is their predictability. I can tell the plot and characterizations of the stories in one single line. Men no good unless they're a minority. Do not forget your place. Women good. And even if women bad, women good. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. <laughs> Let's go through it. In Black Widow, we see Taskmaster, who is revealed to be a woman. <gasps> Surprise. Natasha has to fight her and all the other widows. But wait, none of them are the real enemy, since they are being mind controlled by the true villain, Dracoff, a white man. In Eternals, we find out about Ajax's betrayal, that she knew all along that the Celestial Arishem had sent all of them here to oversee the destruction of Earth when a new Celestial would be born. But wait, Ajax was intending to stop this, and was betrayed by the true villain, Icarus, a white man. In Hawkeye, Kate and Barton are being hunted by Maya. But wait, she's being manipulated and lied to by the true villain, Kingpin, who is, you guessed it, a white man. Even when we discover Kate's mom committed murder and conspired with the Mafia, it's Kate's father's fault. Beautiful. I know you get the point, but I have another example for you from Falcon and Winter Soldier, where the villain, Carly, is clearly a terrorist, where she repeatedly kills innocent people. There are still people in there. This is the only language these people understand. But Falcon refuses to acknowledge that, even when she kills Lamar. Bitch, why are you looking so fucking shocked? Like you weren't punching to kill? Like you hadn't blown up a bunch of civilians earlier? <laughs> but the show is very pointed in not treating Carly as a villain because of her cause. The GRC care more about the people who came back than the ones who never left. We got a glimpse of how things could be. I need to know that you're all committed. Because after tomorrow, there's no going back. One word. One people. One word. One people. One word. One people. Carly and her band of ethnically diverse displaced persons are angry because they were granted property and resources by an organization called the GRC, after Thanos snapped half of our population out of existence. But now those people are back, so the organization had to take that stuff back. What's sad here is that this was an incredible opportunity to explore a very difficult situation. What should the government do after property was given away, but now the rightful owners are back? This could have been explored in an interesting fashion, similar to the great debate of Captain America 
America Civil War, where Tony and Steve went head to head on the issue of safety versus freedom. The reason that debate was so engaging, because first of all, it's a debate we have in our society all the time when faced with actions of the NSA infringing on our rights to privacy versus our desire to be safe. And secondly, as we have seen, it's a question with no easy answer, which is why their disagreement spans several movies, culminating in the fracturing of the Avengers and Thanos snapping his fingers. Unfortunately, in the situation of the Falcon and the curious case of Carly, the writers applied their very black and white approach to this story. Carly is symbolized heavy-handedly, might I add, as the tragic hero and the true villain who happens to be you guessed it, a white man is subjected to a long and very unhelpful lecture. I have no idea how complicated this situation is. I'm a black man carrying the stars and stripes. What don't I understand? You've got to do better, Senator. And we'll be clearly getting an additional lecture on the importance of borderless societies in the future with Marvel's Phase 5 project, Captain America, New World Order. One world. One people. One people. So this is a good time to move on to the part two of this video. What is the goal of Marvel Phase 4? I already mentioned earlier how Phase 4 is an overcorrection from the prior movies where the men had a lot of the glory. But while the previous phases relied on good storytelling, strong characters, both male and female, interesting villains, and intriguing moral conundrums, Marvel Phase 4 has felt more like a lecture, mainly because it isn't story or character driven, but agenda driven. The writers and creators seem more like activists, and the characters now turned into vehicles for them to disseminate their Here's agenda. The I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I do it pretty much every day because if I don't, I will get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become a puppet of woke ideology. And it all feels very much like a talking down to. And there is an overemphasis on representation where instead of it being a strength for this phase, it has become a crutch and a shield to any sort of criticism. Representation in phase four is being used as a threat, as if minorities have to like something simply based on the fact that their culture, religion, ethnicity, or sexual identity is being represented. It's like, I just really hope, you know, our community specifically, the Muslim community, the brown community really like stands up and supports this show because it's very easy to you know say negative things and be and 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 just be very nitpicky about things and it's like we've worked really hard to try to be really smart and specific and educated and well researched and you know just to bring that nuance and detail to the show and I but I just I feel like this is for us this is for this community and, you know, I just want people to know that, like, we do it for the love of our community and the desire to celebrate it. And so I just hope that everyone embraces it and embraces us and um, celebrates the show because it's really for you guys. And representation is being used by the creators and actors as a giant opportunity to pat themselves on the back and congratulate themselves on how unbelievably forward thinking and wise they are. We're a global family, you know, we look like the world. For so long, we've seen superheroes that have looked like a small percentage of the world. This superhero team looks like the world. And I also, you know, in the last year and a half, we sort of learned that we are on the same earth and we all share the same problems, like these boundaries and stuff. They're not as important. These borders are not as important. One world. One people. One people. One people. So as I see it, here's the agenda for phase four, best described in three major points. Number one, women are amazing. Number two, men, unless they are a minority, are stupid, weak, and useless if they aren't evil, power-hungry, and manipulative. 
And number three, why can't people just love each other and stop fighting? Why do we have to have wars or borders? Don't people realize that we are one world, one people? You've got to do better, Senator. Now we're at part three. Let's talk about the impact of Marvel Phase 4. The last point of the importance of loving each other was heavily made during the Eternals and Thor Love and Thunder. Any attempts to understand the logic of Love and Thunder is painful, primarily because it's not designed to tell a good story. It's designed to sell a supposedly deep message, all while emasculating and embarrassing Thor and rattling off as many jokes as humanly possible. And spoiler alert here for anyone who cares about the ending of Thor 4, please move on to the timestamp listed below. But I doubt anyone cares. There's not much of a plot to that movie. At the end of the movie, Thor and Jane somehow convince Gore to choose love instead of the destruction of the gods. It's not death or revenge that you seek. What do I seek? You seek love. Love. Which is just such a strange lesson to teach a man who lost his daughter and was faced with absolute apathy for his suffering from his god. Thor and the rest of the gods are shown as such idiots that care only about themselves and their own pleasures or egos rather than the suffering of others. I mean, Thor cares a little, but it's very unconvincing since he's mostly just obsessed with his old hammer if he's not constantly bumbling on about nothing. Are we sure this is the same character? The message of love is worse in the Eternals where one of the heroes is devastated by humans' willingness to use weapons against each other, specifically during the Second World War. Here is yet another black and white treatment of a very complex war. This is all the equivalent of saying that the Avengers could have defeated Thanos and his armies by giving him a hug. Maybe during the Infinity War, this lady should have made a video for Thanos instead. I'm so sorry that I was not your mother. If I was your mother, you would have been so loved, held in the arms of joyous light. Never would the story's plight the world unfurled before our eyes a pure demise. The problem with this kind of art that subscribes to black and white thinking or agenda-based lecturing results in the audience often falling into one of two very polarized camps. Either you agree with this agenda or you don't. A reasonable response since the phase four stories are practically like propaganda. Attaching victim or oppressor status to people based on the color of their skin or their sexual or gender identity. This is the full Marvel subscription to identity politics and the self-esteem movement intent upon reinforcing one singular idea that if you can self-identify as a victim because of your race, your gender, your sexual identity, then you can be rest assured that anything that goes wrong in your life can be blamed entirely on white men. And this is the reason that people are struggling to connect with these stories. There are a few people in the world that enjoy being told that they're amazing and perfect, but most of the time, that's not what people want to hear. And that's certainly not the role that stories play. Stories, or should I say good stories, are meant to challenge you and make you think beyond what you know, and most importantly, inspire you to be better. Not tell you you're amazing if you're a minority. You're like, I'm always looking up to you. I like it. It's appropriate. And certainly not tell you you're despicable if you happen to be a white man. But the worst impact of Marvel Phase 4 is how we're representing men. So let me ask you, is this what we want? Is this what we all want from our stories? To represent women as so perfect that we can't connect with them and represent men as so utterly useless that they might as well be furniture. I gave my life for a cause. You I don't. thought I was being brave. You, you don't have earpiece. What? what sort of message are we sending young men through stories like this? As strong women, don't we want competent men? Not blundering fools that we can dominate, but equals that we can stand shoulder to shoulder with and meaningful relationships with and accomplish unachievable tasks with. Why have we become so convinced that men need to be kneeling before us, cowering before us, apologizing for existing and being in our presence and praying to us like we're perfect goddesses? Are we so convinced that women are such giant narcissists that we can't be criticized or told that we need to work on a craft before we can be recognized as proficient or experts? That we are such narcissists that we can't stand to be faced with a man 
man that is even remotely confident and capable. You know why Spider-Man No Way Home did so well despite being a mid-pandemic release? It's because it had a good story and no agenda. It had high stakes, difficult decisions, painful sacrifices, but most importantly, it let good men do what they want to do, which is to take their strengths and competence and use it to help people. Men are capable of terrible things, but they are also capable of good. And good stories should encourage them to aspire to a higher good. That's what a hero does. I'm glad we don't limit heroic stories to men anymore, but we have to stop telling men that there is no difference between competence and misogyny, that sharing an opinion is mansplaining, and wanting to protect the women they love is oppressive and condescending, and that in order for them to work with women as equals, so to speak, they need to be stupid and uncertain and utterly emasculated. In closing, this is not empowerment. This is toxic.